Hey hey, welcome to part 3 of my 386SX machine build video series. Last time we figured out what all the jumpers and connectors on the mainboard are used for. And this time we're going to repair this battery asset damage here. Um, I'm not sure how well you can see it on video, but there's one trace that's completely eaten away. These two uh, capacitors. Um, the keyboard connector and I think this is just a ferrite bead. Um, they all have to go. Then I will clean the board and solder them back in. And the same goes for this DRAM socket. It's also corroded. Um, also, I'm not sure if you can really see it that well, but one of the traces that goes below this memory SIM socket that also seems corroded. So I will also remove this um, SIM socket, clean underneath and solder it back in. Yeah, well, let's get started, I guess. Okay, um, I'm going to use my um, desoldering station. Um, I haven't really used it very much yet, so we're going to learn together how to do it, I guess. Um, it's basically just a soldering station with this handgun, which uh, contains or which is powered by an additional pump in the base station and which will then um, or can suck in the liquefied solder through the nozzle. So yeah, that's basically it. <laughs> Let's get started. I started with the keyboard connector, but it turned out that the nozzle was too tiny. The device came with a wider nozzle, but now the soldering tip was already hot, so I decided to do all the other parts first instead. So I began with this disk capacitor. The first few tries didn't go all that well, but with each joint I desoldered it got easier and easier. The trick is to give it enough time to really melt all the solder in the joint and not try to suck it out too early, because then you'll end up with solid solder inside the drill hole and it's really hard to heat that up enough without a good thermal coupling. Sometimes it makes sense to add a small blob of fresh solder before desoldering such a joint. Once the solder is removed I wiggle the pins a bit to make sure they are free and it is easy and safe to remove the cap. On to the second ceramic cap. This time the desoldering went already a lot smoother, but the legs of the cap were sticking to the top of the board. I think most likely because of the corrosion. So I got out a bottle of white vinegar and a q-tip and tried to remove as much of the corrosion as possible. It did indeed help and after a few minutes the cap was free. Getting the ferrite out was much easier. None of the two pins is connected to the ground plane so the heat dissipates much slower. Also the drill holes are a bit wider, which makes it easier to suck out the solder. And in fact it fell just off the board, how convenient. Next came the SIM socket. I hadn't realized before, but these are actually four double row sockets, so I had to do twice as much desoldering here as I had planned. Um, the first row went horribly, I hadn't really gotten the feeling for the solar yet, and so I tried to remove excess solar with diesel ring braid with little actual effect. This is when I learned that adding solar and then redoing it can be much easier. I also raised the temperature from about 300 degrees Celsius to 380. You can also see my learning process quite clearly here. The second row went smoothly with hardly any problems. I checked with a magnifying glass and wiggled the pins to confirm that all the pins were free. Now the socket was only held in place by four plastic nibs. Those were sitting pretty tight in their riveted holes, so I had to use quite a bit of force to remove the socket. I used a plastic tool that is usually used for opening mobile phones and similar tasks. 
I pushed just enough from the bottom that I could fit another plastic lever underneath the socket from the top side and then slowly and carefully remove the socket. Next came the 20 pin DRAM socket. This one was super easy. It's almost as if practicing something makes you better at it. I used the same lever to remove the socket in the end. The last part I had to remove is the keyboard connector. As mentioned earlier, I had to use a different tip for that, so I waited for the tip to cool down and then did the swap. Sadly, I forgot to turn on my camera until I was at the last pin, but it went super smooth with the bigger tip. You'll have to believe me. With all the components that were blocking access to the corroded traces gone, I was finally able to clean off the corrosion. I'm using concentrated white vinegar and applied generously. I also scratch a bit with the Q-tip, I think it's unlikely to cause any more damage besides what the battery has already done. Finally I removed the vinegar with some isopropanol. Now all the green gunk is gone and only a black layer of what I assume is copper 2 oxide is left. That stuff should at least not cause any further corrosion. But I'm not a chemist so I might be completely wrong here. So the damage will not spread any further now but we don't really know yet what this leakage has caused. There are quite a few traces that look a bit suspicious, so I went ahead and checked every single one of them for continuity. And as it turns out, it looks a lot worse than it is. All but two of the traces are still working and I'll only have to fix these two here. What's more, these two traces connect through hole components, so I don't have to try and fix the traces themselves, but I can simply replace them with a wire on the bottom of the board. I was originally going to reuse all the parts I had desoldered, because I didn't have the correct capacitor types or any of the connectors in stock. So I submerged them all in vinegar for a while to get rid of the corrosion and then in alcohol to get rid of the vinegar. But then in a sudden feeling of honor, I decided to bite the bullet and order the replacement parts. That meant several days of waiting for my package to arrive, but it also meant I could replace everything with new stuff. I'm only keeping the SIM socket, because I only removed it to reach the board underneath it, and the ferrite beads. Neither of these components are really available anymore, so I had no other choice anyway. After I received the new parts, I began assembling the board again. I began with the 20-pin dip socket. While soldering it I noticed that the board was not perfectly clean from the bottom and the pads did not really accept the solder really well. So before I continued with the SIM socket I cleaned its pad with alcohol and added a bit of flux to help with the soldering. After that it all went pretty well. When installing the SIM socket I had to be extra careful that the pins are all aligned correctly and double check that the drill holes were free from solder. You need quite a bit of force to push the nibs into their respective drill holes and you don't notice when a pin is misaligned. It's easy to bend or break a pin or even push them out of their holes. Luckily none of them happened to my socket and soldering went fast.
For the ferrite filter I used a new piece of silver plated copper wire of the same diameter. When I tried to solder it, I was wondering why the solder wouldn't stick at all. I also noticed a weird smell and that the flux burned away. After a short while I noticed that my cheap crappy soldering station is exactly that, a piece of crap. The temperature regulation had failed and the iron overheated. After turning it off and back on, the temperature display was out of range and I think it goes all the way up to 450 degrees. I guess the old proverb is right, buy cheap, buy twice. So I'll soon have to get a decent brand soldering station. In the end nothing bad happened and after letting it cool down and then looking carefully after the temperature, I soldered the remaining parts. On the keyboard jack I used a bit more solder than I would normally do because of the physical stress these joints have to endure when plugging and unplugging the keyboard. The 100 nanofarad ceramic caps I bought had a different pin pitch than the old one, so it didn't fit quite as beautifully, but it'll work fine, even if it doesn't look as good. With all the components back in place, all that was left to do was replacing the two broken traces with wires. I begin with the one that connects the disk capacitor to the ferrite filter. And then I continued with the long one that goes from the power supply connector's power good pin to the power good pin on the main board. This one is not strictly needed because the board has its own circuitry to detect the stable power source, but I like it better this way. After a quick check that the joints are okay, I can finally test the board for the first time. Exciting! Let's do the necessary preparation work for the first test. Of course we need to set the jumpers, but some of the pin headers are bent, so I first had to straighten them. And yes, they are straight afterwards, but the perspective makes it look like I actually made it worse. Thanks to my research from the last episode, I can quickly set the jumpers. I'm enabling pipeline memory mode, I hardwire turbo mode and set it to hardware control turbo. Let's also not forget about the power good switch we repaired and make it retain CMOS settings even though there's no CMOS battery yet. 
A computer without memory is not very useful and usually won't do anything except beeping an error code through the PC speaker. So here are a whopping 4 max of DRAM. These 30 pin sims have a data width of 8 bits. The 386SX has a 16 bit external data bus, so we always need to install the sims in pairs of two. That's why two sockets are always labeled as one bank. These sim sockets are a bit fragile, so I'm trying to be as careful as possible. This is the case I'm going to use for the machine, and you will see more of it in the next episode. I've never tried it, so I'm first checking the power supply's voltage levels. What's immediately obvious though is that I'll have to replace the fan. But what about the voltages? 5 volts appear to be fine. Same for the 12 volts. And the same also goes for the minus 12 and minus 5 volts, as well as for the power good signal, which should be at 5 volts. For testing, I'm just setting up the board on a cardboard box real quick. It's easy to remember how the AT power cables need to be installed, just put the black wires together in the center. Here's the Cirrus Logic VGA card that rocked the 16 bit VGA benchmark shootout. You will see more of it in an upcoming episode, too. After plugging in the keyboard and the monitor, it's time to fire up the machine for the very first time. And it starts just fine. It detects all the installed memory and the keyboard is working too. The BIOS comes with several color themes, quite useless but fun nonetheless. And yeah, that's it for this episode really. I really hope you liked it, because I really enjoyed making it. In the coming episodes I'll prepare the remaining hardware and put it all together. I think there are at least 4 or 5 episodes left in the series. Let's see where it leads. If you did actually like it, please consider giving it a thumbs up, subscribing to the channel and following me on Twitter. I mostly tweet about stuff I'm working on, so that might be something for you as well. Until next time, bye!